Hi everyone, I'm Mrs. Gillette. And I'm Dr. Gillette. And we are here to guide you through how to come up with a science inquiry topic and how to set up and complete a project for the STEAM Fair. You will also follow this process if you do an environmental exploration project. There are a few simple steps to follow, so grab a journal and let's get started. All right, to help get your idea, you can observe the world around you and ask questions about the things you observe. Start by taking a walk through your neighborhood with your family or around the playground at school. Here is a picture of a playground, and there are so many interesting things. First, there are clouds in the sky. I see wet areas on the blacktop. I notice there are patches of yellow grass in the middle of the field. I notice there are kids playing on the swings, and some are higher than others. There is a game of tetherball, and I see kids walking around the playground. Did you also see the shade under the playset? Wow, that is a lot going on in such a small area. And I have so many questions. Why is the grass only yellow in certain spots? Did something happen to the grass? Is it not getting enough water? Did something spill there? Why are some students not playing? Are they sick? Did they fall and hurt themselves? Why are they using that particular ball for their game of tetherball? And why isn't anybody playing handball? Last, why are only some areas of that black top wet? These are some great questions. When deciding which question to answer, you want to think about what interests you. What do you want to learn more about? So seeing that handball court, it reminds me of something I was wondering the last time I played that game. I noticed that the red playground balls were easier to play with than a basketball or a soccer ball. Why is this? Is it the material the ball is made of? Is it how hard or soft the ball is? Why does one ball bounce higher than another? Now we need to think about which questions are testable. We can come up with a basic answer for most of them, but which ones can we run a test on? Which one allows us to set up an experiment to help us answer the question? You could ask, what type of playground ball will bounce the highest? Make sure to include specific mention of what balls you intend to test. You could choose a playground ball, a soccer ball, and a basketball. Make sure to include these examples in your question. Which type of playground ball will bounce the highest? A playground ball, soccer ball, or basketball? Now I need to do some research. I need to look up what other people have learned about balls and their bounce. I learned that the more elastic a ball is, the more it bounces. When something is elastic, it stretches and then returns to its original shape. Think of your sweatpants. You can pull it apart and let it go back. When a ball is more elastic, it compresses or gets smushed when it hits the ground and then quickly goes back to its original shape, which pushes the ball off the ground and up into the air. Some balls are not as elastic as others. So there's not as much compression and push, so they don't bounce as high. So now you have a specific question and you've completed your research. It's time for you to make a guess about what you think the answer will be. A hypothesis is an educated guess about what you think will happen when you conduct your experiment. In this case, which ball will bounce the highest? Let's practice making a hypothesis. Start by saying, I think the playground ball will bounce the highest. You could also say, I believe the playground ball will bounce the highest. Go back to that statement and remove the words, I think, or I believe. Your new hypothesis is, the playground ball will bounce the highest. You can now add a because statement at the end of your new hypothesis. A because statement gives the reader some idea why you stated your hypothesis the way you did. Ask yourself why you believe the playground ball will bounce the highest. Is it because while you were researching bouncy balls, you found that these balls are always the most elastic? Add this answer to the tail end of your hypothesis. The playground ball will bounce the highest because it is a more elastic material. Your hypothesis is now an educated guess. It's a guess because you really don't have any evidence proving which ball will bounce the highest. 
but you do have some idea about how the balls will bounce based on the research you did. Let's first design your experiment and try to be practical. Would it be practical to drop each of your playground balls from the top of a five-story building? Probably not. We can pick a height that's easy to work with and allows us to repeat the experiment. Maybe you can drop each playground ball from a height of, say, three feet. We can use a yardstick as our guide. Now, should we sight the top of each ball at three feet or the bottom of each ball at three feet? You can choose either option, but just make sure you use the same procedure for each drop. You wouldn't want to give an unfair advantage to one ball or another. So to make it easy to collect the evidence, we want to tape a yardstick here to the wall. You're going to line up the bottom of the ball and then drop it. And you're going to look at the numbers to see how high it bounces. So now you're going to practice with each ball. And to make it even more fun, you can always do a countdown. So, three, two, one. And then we'll try it with the basketball. Okay, were you able to see the difference there? Well, now you notice how, how far it bounced back up. But it was just, we looked really quickly. So now what you want to do is you want to have a family member help you and they're going to watch to see how high each ball goes looking at the bottom of the ball. So let's collect some data. We just created our procedures, a step-by-step -step written guide on how we are planning to perform your experiment. You'll also want to have a list of all the materials you have used. This is called the materials list. Add this information to your journal. We are now ready to collect some evidence. When each ball bounced, you could probably see how high it bounced while looking at the yardstick. But that's not accurate enough. Have someone in your family watch carefully and write down how high each ball bounced. Just like how you perform the drop, Decide if you should watch the top of the ball or the bottom of the ball while it bounces. Let's plan to sight the bottom of the ball to measure the bounce. Could you have dropped the ball in any way that may have influenced the bounce? Maybe you flicked a finger or accidentally pushed down while you released the ball. The best way to reduce any unwanted influence is to repeat the experiment multiple times and average your results. Let's plan on dropping each playground ball I don't know, 10 times, 30 drops in total. Averaging your results eliminates any mistakes you, have may have, you may have made while dropping the ball. Doing an experiment 10 times is a nice number of trials and it's easy to find the average. Science works best when we only change one thing at a time. The thing we change are called variables. Make sure to only change one variable per experiment. The variable we are changing is called the independent variable. It's what we're testing. In this case, it's the type of ball. The other variable, the height of the drop, well, that's called the controlled variable. This is what's staying the same. We are keeping it constant during the entire experiment. We are measuring the bounce height of each ball this is called the dependent variable. In other words, the bounce height of each ball is dependent on the type of ball that is being bounced. You also want to organize the data you're collecting. Since we plan on dropping three balls from one set height and measuring the bounce multiple times, I'm seeing this being recorded in a data chart. The title of the chart is Ball Bounce from Three Feet. The chart has three columns, one for each type of ball, playground ball, soccer ball, and basketball. Under each column are 10 rows, each row for each test, with a final row to average the results. Make sure you plan your experiment so that it can be easily finished in a reasonable amount of time. We've heard lots of great experiments from kids that are just too big to tackle. 
Pick something that is reasonable and discuss with your parents or teacher to be sure that an experiment is something that can be completed on time. Now's the time to look at your data. First, look for numbers that don't make any sense. You might have a number that doesn't fit. It's easy to make a mistake and record the wrong number. If you saw a ball that has a recorded bounce of 45 feet, do you think that makes sense when you only dropped each ball from three feet? It's natural to assume that each bounce will be less than the drop of three feet. Second, you'll want each number to have a correct unit of measure. In this case, each bounce should have a label of centimeters or inches. Data without labels are only numbers, and we're not collecting numbers, we are collecting data. Third, you will need to create an average for each column of data. Remember, averaging eliminates mistakes you may have accidentally introduced. Add up all your data for each type of ball and divide by 10, assuming you performed 10 drops. Don't be afraid of your data, even if it's telling you something you didn't expect. You should also turn your data into a graph. Maybe you could create a bar graph to show the average height of each ball's average bounce. Graphs make it easier for people to read your table and understand what you tested. Fourth, look at your data, including the averages, and write a results statement. A results statement is a sentence or paragraph that clearly states what your data is showing and tells everyone what your data means. Let's pretend for a moment that the basketball actually bounced the highest. A results statement for the project we're demonstrating might be, the basketball bounced the highest, the playground ball had the second highest bounce, and the soccer ball bounced the least. The final statement you need to create is a conclusion. The conclusion clearly explains what you found out and states if your hypothesis was right or wrong. Don't be afraid of your hypothesis being wrong. Follow your data. Great science has been performed when a scientist's hypothesis was wrong. Your conclusion statement may say, based on the data, my hypothesis was wrong. The basketball bounced the highest. You don't fail just because your hypothesis was wrong. In fact, you succeed because you found out something you didn't know before. So now is the time to share what you've learned. You might want to talk with your teacher about specific requirements for completing a science project. Generally, there are 10 parts to the science fair project. The 10 parts are title, question, research, hypothesis, procedures, materials, data, graph, results, and conclusion. Most projects are presented on a science fair backboard along with a notebook. Science fair backboards can be found at most big box stores or your school. Don't worry if you don't have a backboard. An old cardboard box will do just fine. The notebook contains all the same information as the backboard but is really meant to show off your research. As you start to assemble your backboard, you'll want to think of your project like a story with a beginning, middle, and end. Your title should be centered at the top of the backboard. Your question, hypothesis, and research is like the beginning of a story and should be featured on the left of your backboard. The procedures and material list is like the middle of your story and should be in the middle of your backboard. Finally, the data, graph, results, and conclusion is the end of your story and should be on the right side of your backboard. The final design is up to you, but generally people, specifically science fair judges, like to read a board from left to right. Some students like to bring along examples of what they tested or objects involved with your project. Check with your teacher first to make sure you can bring those specific items to school. Some are not allowed. It's generally a good idea to leave expensive items at home. A great way to show off what you did is with pictures. Take pictures while you're doing your experiment and pictures of the equipment you might have used. Adding pictures to your backboard and notebook is a great way to explain to your audience what you wanted to accomplish. Sometimes situations require students to create a virtual board instead of a physical backboard. Make sure to talk with your teachers about specific requirements. 
Generally, anything that can be placed on a physical backboard can also be put on a virtual board using software such as Google Slides or Microsoft PowerPoint. Throughout this process, we hope you have fun and learn some new things. Science can be an interesting and rewarding subject to study, and we hope we've made a scientist out of you. Thanks for joining us, and we can't wait to see your projects.